right? So if we're going to start off, wait, can, first of all, can everyone hear me? Yeah? Okay. So starting off, what is the difference between a pure substance and a mixture? Anyone? Yeah? Perfect. So starting off the bat, a pure substance would be something that occurs naturally by its own. So for example, an atom or a compound. So a pure substance would be something like helium, H2O, CO2, etc. Now a mixture. A mixture would just be a mixture of those things. So for example, you could have salt water. Salt water would be a mixture of H2O and sodium chloride. Hmm? Or sand and water, another perfect example. So going from there, we have two different types of pure substances. We have pure elements and pure compounds. What's a pure element and what's a pure compound? So perfect, just the element. So helium, sodium, lithium, any of the above. Um, going from that, what would be a pure compound? Water. Water, perfect. Okay. Going from there, we have two different types of mixtures. We have a homogeneous and a heterogeneous mixture. What would be, what would be an example of a homogeneous mixture? So water and salt, yes. What, what makes that? Uh, because like it just looks like it doesn't. It just looks like uh, one thing. It doesn't look like. Perfectly, it's uniform. It's, it's you can't physically separate it. It's uniform, and by just looking at it, you can't tell a difference. So, a homogeneous mixture would be something like salt water. Uh, heterogeneous mixture would be an example of that. Yeah, sand and water. So as you can see, the sand will set on the bottom, and the salt water will be kind of above it. You can see a physical difference between the sand and the salt water. So even though sugar does not fully dissolve, when you look at a sugar molecule in water, right. it's all evenly distributed. Okay. Yeah. A good question. Yeah. Um, what's an example of a compound that's not a pure compound? Um, a pure compound would be, would just be a mixture. Oh, like a not pure compound? It would just be a mixture? It would just be a mixture of two different things. So a pure substance is either an element or a compound? Yeah. Okay. They have to be bonded to each other. Or as a compound or an element would just be an uh, element on the periodic table. Okay. All right, what are some key character characteristics to hypothesis, hypothesis, observation, law, and a theory? So starting off, what's an observation? Yeah, perfect. Something that you see that happens. So for example, the door is brown. So what you see, i.e., the door is, oh god, okay, uh, a hypothesis, what would be a hypothesis? Anyone? An so, yeah, perfect, so a hypothesis would be an explanation of the observation. For example, your observation is the door is brown, a hypothesis would be the door is brown because it's made out of wood. The hypothesis could be correct or incorrect, you will find out later in later testings. So, uh, what are some key words that you find in hypothesis normally? If statements as a result of, because of, something like that. 
uh, a law. What is a law? Anyone? So something that's seen in nature, it's usually made after a set of observations. Yeah, so that's great. Observations. A theory would just be a law that is made after many tests have proven it true. All right. So going on there. I know I have terrible handwriting, so if you guys can't see something, please let me know. Uh, physical and chemical properties. What are some examples of a physical property? Yeah. Density. Density. So perfect. So why is density a form of physical, a physical property? Or so when you're looking at physical properties, you're seeing what about that compound does not change. For example, if you take the density of the compound, you're not measuring if it can change relative to something else, if that kind of makes sense. Whereas a chemical property, like you're looking for explosiveness, so when you combust the compound, you're changing that element, which would make it a chemical change. So what are some chemical properties that matter besides combustion? So acidity, perfect. Anything else? Yeah? So vaporization, are you changing the process? So flammability would be one, but vaporization would be more of a physical property. Yeah, boiling point, vaporization, same thing. So, what'd you say? Um, Flint. Flint. All right. So, what is the difference between an intensive and extensive property? <laughs> so, intensive property, does it matter on the amount you have? No. So, intensive property. is independent of the mass. One way I like to remember that is intensive property and independent both start with I's, so something easy to see. So does anyone know an intensive property? Or give me an example of one. Temperature. Temperature. Perfect. So when you have a stone, let's say, it can you're sitting outside, it's 78 degrees outside. The stone's going to be 78 degrees, whether it's a huge rock or a little stone. All right, what's an example of an extensive property? So mass. So when you have a rock again, you can have a small rock. It'll have a different mass than like a boulder. But density will always be an intensive property. When you have a compound that's, well, density is grams over your volume. So since it will have a similar mass, yeah, it has the same ratio, so it'll always have the same density. So independent of mass, that would be temperature or density, where an extensive property is dependent on mass. An example of that would be uh, mass or something else like size or length or volume. Perfect. All right, so last part in chapter one. Uh, let's say we have a 35 milligram stone displaced in water. It displaces the water to 120 milliliters. Uh, we're trying to find the density of the stone. First off, what is our formula for density? 
So density equals grams over milliliters. Or what are something else that we can substitute milliliters for? Centimeters cubed, maybe? I know Dr. Beasley likes to substitute the milliliters for centimeters cubed. So if she asks for it in centimeters cubed, it's the exact same thing as a milliliter. So given this information, how are we going to find our grams of the stone? Yeah. Um, if they give it to you in like anything other than that, you have to convert it back to grams or milliliters? Uh, it depends on what your answer choices are. So more than likely, your answer choices will be in grams or milliliters. They could also be in grams over liters or, or kilograms over liters or something like that. For milligrams or milliliters, you can still do it in that formula. You just have to fix it at the end. Correct. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So grams over milliliters or centimeters cubed. Okay. So we have 35 milliliter, or milligrams. How do we get that into grams? Anyone? So perfect. So we know that one gram is equal to 1,000 milligrams, which would equal 0 0.035, right? grams. Now, milliliters. How can we find our milliliters? We have two different milliliter measurements, 100 and 120. So, you're basically the mass divided by the weight. So, perfect. The, well, not necessarily the mass. So, we can take our starting volume of water, which was 100, and we know that the stone displaced 120 milliliters. So, so take... Wouldn't it be 120 minus 100? So, perfect. Yeah. 120 minus 100 milliliters will give us the milliliters of stone or centimeters cubed of stone, which is both a volume measurement. So that will be 20 milliliters. Perfect, yeah. Like yep. Okay. All right, so we do this calculation, and we should get, I don't know, Point zero zero one eight grams per milliliter. Okay. Okay. Per, oh, okay. So, point zero zero one seven five. We are going to round to zero zero one eight because we have two significant figures. So, we have two significant figures from our thirty-five milligrams of the stone and the two significant figures from our twenty milliliters. So that'll give our answer with two significant figures. Now, how do we convert this into scientific notation? So yeah, I heard it. One times ten, or one point eight times ten to the negative three. Please don't forget how to do scientific notation. I know it was a long time ago, but it is still relevant. Any other questions on this page before I go on? No. All right. Yes. So it was a small number, so small numbers will have negative uh, exponents. All right, so next, converting Kelvin into Celsius and Fahrenheit. We have 283 Kelvin. How can we determine Celsius from this? Perfect. So you're going to subtract 273 equals Celsius, which equals 10. Okay. Now, how can we get from Celsius to Fahrenheit? So, yeah, so perfect. So Celsius equals Fahrenheit minus 32 over 1.8. Or we can fix this into Celsius times 1.8. That's not there. There we go. Yeah. So, I know. 1.8 Celsius plus 32 equals Fahrenheit. And if we do that, what is it? 1.8, 18 plus 32 is 40. So, Fahrenheit equals 40. All good? All right. 
So number seven, accuracy and precision. Let's say I have two targets. I know they're not perfect. So if I get close to the target, what is that? Accuracy. So accuracy is how close you get to the target. So given that, what would precision be? Yeah, how consistent you are. So you might be able to shoot it over and over an arrow in this area. This would be precise, but not accurate. You can have precision and accuracy, accuracy without precision. That's all of them can happen. All right? Fifty? Oh yeah, it is. I'm sorry. Yeah. 18 plus 32 is 50, not 40. Thank you. All right, so law of conservation of mass, law of definite proportions, and law of multiple proportions. I know it's a lot. Can someone give me an example of one or what the definition of one is? Conservation of mass, OK. Go for it. So that would, that is true. Mass cannot be created or destroyed. Anyone know what that is? Law of conservation of mass. Yeah, so it's, I think it's the first or second law, the thermodynamics. But the law of conservation of mass is nothing can be created or destroyed. And whatever you have on your product side, you're going to have on your reactant side. So you have 100 grams of reactants, you're going to have 100 grams of products. So, yeah, so products equals reactants. Okay. Law of definite proportions. Can someone give me an example of that? So isn't it basically that like H2O is always going to be two hydrogen and one oxygen? Perfect. So H2O, whenever you see a water molecule, it'll always be H2O. There's two hydrogen atoms bonded to an oxygen atom. No matter what, I don't care where you are, that's what water is. Law of multiple proportions. It's a little bit more complicated. Anyone else? Law of multiple proportions. So the law of multiple proportions states that when you have two atoms coming together, form different compounds. They will always come together in low number ratios. For example, when you have nitrogen and oxygen coming together, you have NO or NO2. If you take the ratio of NO divided by NO2, here, I've got it. Uh, they will come to a whole number ratio. This was the best way I could find out how to explain it. So you have mass ratio of nitrogen to oxygen. So one gram of nitrogen equals 0.875 grams of oxygen. Uh, in your second compound, uh, one gram of nitrogen equals 0.437 grams of oxygen. By dividing the two, you can find out that they uh, come together in one to, one to two ratio because there's two oxygens for every one oxygen. This is online, so if you guys don't have enough time to write it, that's fine. Does that make sense? Yeah? If Yeah, so pretty much. Um, not really. Yes, and yes, and no. <laughs> we'll get there later for what an empirical formula is. Okay, so number nine, plum pudding model. What is it? Who disproved it? All right, so plum pudding model is if we have like an atom, we have protons, neutrons, and electrons all spread out through the atom randomly. Now disproving it, 
Do, does anyone know who disproved it? Rutherford. So yeah, good name to know maybe. Um, he disproved it by using what experiment? The gold foil experiment. Great. So. So he shot alpha particles at a gold foil and saw that most of it went through. Because most of the alpha particles went through, he concluded that most of the atom is empty space. Because they went through. If they were, he was expecting them to be bounced back, right. and since they, or, or, bounce or bounce around, and since they didn't, he found out that most of the atom is empty space, which later led to proton center and so on. Okay, so determining the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. For oxygen, for example, we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. How many protons are you going to have for oxygen? Eight. So if you look at the periodic table, which is right here, we can see that oxygen has an atomic, or atomic number of eight, which means that it will always have eight protons. No matter what, when you find an oxygen atom, it has to have eight protons. So protons would be eight. Knowing this information, how can we find the number of neutrons in this molecule? So, perfect. So we're going to subtract the atomic mass by the atomic number. And that'll give us eight neutrons. Since protons and neutrons are effectively the only thing with mass in an atom, they're the only thing contributing to the atomic mass of the atom. Uh, knowing that, we have eight protons, which effectively have one AMU unit. Neutrons also have one AMU, AMU unit, so we can subtract, subtract the two and find out the number of protons or neutrons. Does that make sense? Okay. Electrons. How many electrons does this atom have? So 10. How do we get that? We have our eight protons. And in order to know that oxygen, we can start off with oxygen having eight protons since it's neutral. But this oxygen has a minus two charge, which means it had to have gained two more electrons than the protons. And in order to do that, it has to have 10 electrons rather than the eight. So the protons and electrons are always the same unless there's a charge because atoms like to stay neutral. So in our next example, we have bromide. It does not have a charge. So we can go from there. How many protons is it going to have? 35. Thank you. How many electrons? Uh, a little bit, right? No. 45? Oh, I'm sorry. Electrons, yeah, 35. So yeah, we have 45 neutrons because 35 minus 80 is 45. And then electrons, since we have a neutral molecule, it'll have 35 electrons. Next, we have sodium right here. So protons, neutrons, and electrons. How many are we going to have? 11. Great. So we have 11 protons, because that's the number of, uh, that's the atomic number on sodium. There you go. Neutrons. How many neutrons are we going to have? 12. Thank you. And then electrons. 10. Why do we have 10 and not 12 or 11? So we have a plus one charge. And we cannot change the protons, because changing the protons would change the atom. So calcium, what do we have here? How many protons? What? 20, yeah. Neutrons? 20. Electrons? 20. Perfect. OK. Next, what is an anion, cation, and isotope? Anyone? Perfect. So an anion is negative. Just a negative ion. So for example, fluorine 
it'll have a minus one charge after it, don't it, after it accepts an electron. So it'll become a fluorine ion once it accepts the electron, and it'll be an anion because it's a negative charge. Okay, cation, positive charged ion. One way to remember the two is cat has a T, which kind of looks like a plus. So one easy way. That's how I like to remember it. I know other people. Yeah, cats are also nice, so it's a positive <laughs> feeling. All right, isotopes. What are isotopes? So not necessarily. An isotope would be an atom with a different number of neutrons. So there is no standard number of neutrons. The atomic masses, if you look, are all a combination of all the different neutrons. So you could have, more than likely, uh, for Dr. Beasley, she might say which two atoms are isotopes of each other. And she'll give you like sodium. She'll give you sodium 11 and sodium 12, for example. Uh, since, or sodium 23 and sodium 22 since they have different atomic masses, but the same number of protons, you know they have to be isotopes because the only thing changing is the atomic mass. Since you have the same number of protons, you're going to have a different number of neutrons. Yeah. Yes? For hydrogen? For Neutron, it's, yeah, one-ish. It depends on your hydrogen atom. But if, don't worry about that. That's not going to be a trick question. Isotopes are a different number of, or atoms with different number of neutrons. Okay, so here we're calculating the average atomic mass. And like your question before, so we have an element X 15, 17, and 18. Those would all be different isotopes because they have a different number of neutrons. They're the same element, but they have a different number of neutrons. So how are we going to calculate the average atomic mass of all three of these? Perfect. We're going to multiply our percent abundance by our mass. So we have to change our percent into a decimal. So 0 0.15, 0 0.278. 0.572. Okay, we're going to multiply all these, and that'll give us 4.64. Since we have three significant figures, we're going to underline the three. Uh, 8.95. And 19.25, but we only have three, three. Add them all together, and we'll have 32.85. Okay. Since we only have three significant figures from our percent abundances, we can round this to 33, or 32.9. That's just the answer. Yep. How would you do it if they like ask the officer like um assign the percent So let's say this was X. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we would know point one five times thirty point nine something plus point two seven eight times 32. Yeah. Yeah. You just substitute the x for the equal. Yep. Any other questions for that? No? All right. Number 13. Which elements are diatomic? Which elements are polyatomic? So I don't know exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, so there's two ways to do it. It's like a seven. So you take nitrogen over to fluorine and down to uh, iodine. Plus your hydrogen, thank you. Or your diatomic elements would be Hofbrinkle. So hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromide, iodine, chlorine, and that's it. I know. Oh, Brinkle, B-R-I-N, yeah, Brinkle. I know, you guys are all laughing. It helps. <laughs> Don't laugh at me now. <laughs> okay, polyatomic ions, which ones are those? P-S, selenium, yep, so. Yeah, so perfect, it's gonna be S8, P4, or yeah. P4, S8, S8, something like that. Um, so you might have a compound like oxygen gas. You have to know that oxygen gas is diatomic, so its molar mass will be 32 instead of 16. Oxygen is molar mass? Yes, oxygen gas is molar mass, is 32. Because oxygen gas will be O2. So for every one mole of O2, you're going to have 32 grams, roughly. Yeah. Polyatomic would be phosphorus, sulfur, selenium. It's like in seven. Yeah, it's like a little seven. Here's the regular. Yeah. So that would just be a compound. When we're looking at diatomic elements, we're looking at their natural stable state. So when you look at an oxygen gas atom, it'll be O2. Okay. But good question. All right, naming compounds. CS2S. What are we going to do? You have no idea. Okay, so first we're going to look at cesium. We find cesium down here and sulfur over here. So, so it's an ionic compound because we have a, a metal and a nonmetal. Knowing that, are we going to use. Uh, prefixes? No. So we're going to name the compound cesium sulfide. Yeah. So an ionic compound, you're going to take your element one plus your element two, and you're going to add IDE to the end of it. So element one plus. Two plus I D E. So you're going to change the end of sulfur to sulfide. So we'll get there. Okay. Uh, C A N O three two. What would that be? So calcium nitrate. We're going to look. See calcium over here. It's a metal and it has a predictable charge, so we do not need Roman numerals. So calcium. And then NO3. Uh, if you are in Dr. Beasley's class, she will give you your polyatomic ions. I know, I know, Patino people. I had Patino too. <laughs> so if not, you have to memorize this. Um, but Beasley. You get it, so you can look at your compound, and it's nitrate. It's given to us on our test. <laughs> you just look up common polyatomic ions. Yeah. Do you guys have to memorize solubility rules? <laughs> okay. Both. So you're here for the ACS? Yes. Okay. Okay. So calcium nitrate. Okay, chromium three permanganate. How are we gonna write that out? We're gonna find chromium on our periodic table, which is right here. It does not have a predictable charge, so that's why it has the Roman numerals. Uh, the Roman numerals indicates its charge, so we know that chromium has a plus three charge. Permanganate. What is a charge of, or what is permanganate? Anyone? 
So MnO4 with a negative charge. Okay. So since permanganate has a minus one charge and chromium has a plus three charge, how many permanganates do we need to cancel out? Three. Okay. So H3PO4. How are we going to name that? So first, we can identify it as an acid. Since it's an acid with a polyatomic ion, we're going to name the polyatomic ion. So phosphate. So phosphate, since it ends with eight, it's going to change to ick. So if you remember, in Dr. Beasley's class, he said, eight changes to ick, eight changes to us. You bite some, yeah. You ate something icky, you bite something delicious. I know it's stupid, but it'll help on your final. Eight to ick, or eight to ick, so you ate something icky. Eight to us, bite something delicious. So if it has hydrogen in front, it's going to be more, more than likely it'll be an acid, except for like H2O. So if it's an H in front of the point. Yeah, it will always be an acid. Okay. So phosphoric. So we have phosphate. Yeah, phosphate is going to be changed into phosphoric acid. OK, hydrochloric acid, how are we going to write that? HCl. So since it is not a polyatomic ion, we have to have the hydro instead of the chlorine. Chlorine, so hydrochloric acid. And I'm sorry, I forgot. I thought we had a polyatomic, or um, a uh, covalent compound on here. So for covalent compounds, you're going to have your prefix plus the element. So what are our prefixes? What's one? Mono, di, tri, four. Tetra, five. Penta, six. Hexa, seven. Hepta, hepta, H-E-P-T-A. Hepta is seven. Hexa is six. Eight, octa, nine, nana. So on. So wait. Okay, never mind. So for the acid, if it's not the H in front of polyatomic, how you know if it would say acid or HCl? Yeah. Okay. It'll say uh, hydrochloric acid. Okay, going from there. Um, so yeah, prefix plus second ele element plus prefix element. ID. Yeah. Of, uh, yeah. So we have NO2. What would NO2 be? So nitrogen dioxide. So since the first element is one, it's implied that mono is already there, so you don't have to say mono nitrogen dioxide. So this would just be nitrogen dioxide. <coughs> yes, for molecular compounds. <laughs> yeah. If it's a transition metal, you have to identify the charge on it and do the Roman numerals. And the charge would be based off of the charge of whatever. Yeah. OK, moving on. How are we going to determine the number of calcium ions in 43 grams of calcium nitrate? So we have 43 grams. CaNO3, 2. How are we going to get that into moles? One mole, CaNO3, two. 
And we're going to divide that by the molar mass of calcium nitrate, which is 164.086 grams. Okay. Now we have our moles of calcium nitrate. How can we find the number of moles of calcium? So it's one because right here is theoretically a one. So we're going to have a one to one ratio. Now if it was uh, nitrate, we'd have two to one ratio. Because for every calcium nitrate ion, there's two nitri nitrates for every one calcium nitrate. But for in this instance, we're going to have one mole calcium over one mole calcium nitrate. So, so we have to it by yeah, perfect. So after we find out the number of moles of calcium, we have to change, or we have to find out the number of ions. Now, if we remember Avogadro's number, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole. So we can cancel out all of our things. And this will equal 1.6 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Just be careful. <laughs> Can't help you there. It like will be like really off, like even if you put it in right. If it's something with the parentheses, whatever. Yeah, make sure you use your parentheses right. Uh, okay, mass percent of oxygen and calcium nitrate. How are we going to determine that? Of the compound. Perfect. So we're going to take our mass of the oxygen that is contributing. So we know that oxygen has a mass of 16 about 15.99 if you use a periodic table. And we have six of them, so we're going to have to multiply it by six. Okay, now in our last problem we found that uh, the molar mass of calcium nitrate is 164.086 grams. Okay, so we solve that and we get our mass percent, which is 0.58. 0.585. Now to get the decimal into a percentage, we have to multiply it by 100, which will equal 58.5%. So we know that oxygen is going to be contributing 58.5% of the mass of calcium nitrate. Yeah. So if we look at our element, or we have nitrate, NO3. So we have three atoms of oxygen for every one nitrate atom, but we have two nitrate atoms, so we have to multiply it by two. So three times six, or three times two is six. So we have six oxygen atoms, and so on. Good question, though. The atomic mass. Okay. So we're trying to find the empirical formula and the molecular formula. What is an empirical formula? So yeah, the most reduced compound or a compound with the least common denominator. Uh, going from there, how are we going to get this compound into its empirical formula? Yeah, so we're going to convert it to grams. We're going to assume we have a 100 gram compound. If we have a 100 gram compound, 65.5% of it will be 65.5 grams. So we have 65.5 grams carbon. We have 5.5 grams hydrogen. And 29.0 grams oxygen. Okay. 
now when we're trying to find our empirical formulas, we like to compare everything with moles. So how are we going to convert carbon into moles? Yeah, so 12 grams is the molar mass. How are we going to do hydrogen? Okay, so we take our grams of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We find how many moles there are. Uh, we do that by dividing by the molar mass, and we get uh, the, molar, the moles of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. What are we going to do next? So divide by the lowest, which is 1.81. So what does that equal, anyone? So C3H3O1. Okay. Now, is that our final answer for our empirical formula? Yes. Yep. So how do we find our molecular formula from that? So perfect. So. The molar mass of this compound is 12 times 3 plus 3 times 1.01 plus. So we're going to take our molar mass of our empirical formula and divide it by the molar mass of the molecular formula. So 55.03 divided by 110 grams is about 2. So what does that mean? So we're going to multiply everything by 2. So we would get C, oh god, C6, yeah, 0.5. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're going to do 110 grams divided by the 55. So we're going to take our molecular formula and divide by the empirical formula. So about two, so we get C6H6O2. Any questions on that? We're dividing by the molar mass of our empirical formula, and we calculate the empirical formula mass to be 55. Okay. Anything else before I flip the page? Yeah. It's all online, too. Uh, it goes into more detail online. Okay, number 18. Okay, when placed in water, how many, uh, how does NaCl differ from glucose? So we were talking about this earlier. How does it look? Uh, well, basically, NaCl would completely dissolve, right? So NaCl will completely dissolve into sodium and chlorine ions. So we have Na plus Cl minus H2O. So all ionic compounds will dissociate. Okay. So since glucose is not an ionic compound, it's covalently bonded, it's going to stay together. So we're going to have glucose, so C6H12O6. So when we dissolve our sugar into water, we'll have our glucose surrounded by the waters. Okay. 
Now, when ions associate, like NaCl, what do we call those? Electrolytes. What makes something a strong electrolyte versus a weak electrolyte? So it dissolves completely. So electrolytes are ions that dissolve or dissociate. And the more it dissociates, the stronger the electrolyte is. Um, I don't know if you guys need to know that. I don't think you guys need to know that. That's later. Yes. An example, like NaCl would be a strong electrolyte. Anything that partially dissolves, so like HF would be a weak electrolyte, or weak acid, or not necessarily. Ionic compounds always dissociate. The amount they dissociate depends on how strong an electrolyte they are. It's a good question. So would you have to memorize like weak and strong ones? Like if they ask like which is the weakest, yeah. you yeah. have to memorize that? If you just memorize the seven strong ones, then whatever's not in that list of seven is going to be the weak one. That's a good okay. way of thinking. Yeah, thank you. OK, number 19. How many grams of carbon dioxide is needed to produce 18 grams of glucose? So how are we going to go about this equation? What's the first thing we do? Always balance. I know Dr. Beasley likes to leave uh, equations unbalanced, so we need to balance this one. We'll have 6, 6, 6, and 1. OK? Going from there, we have 18 grams of glucose. How do we find uh, the moles of glucose? Convert it. Convert it. So one mole over 180.16 grams. C6H12. Six. Okay. Now we need to convert our moles of glucose into moles of carbon dioxide. How are we going to do that? So the molar, we have to find the molar ratio. And we know that for every one glucose, there's six carbon dioxides. So we're actually going to multiply by six carbon dioxides over one mole glucose. C is six H12. OK? What do we do next? Find the grams of carbon dioxide. So we multiply it by our molar mass, which is 44 grams over one mole. Overall, you should get 26 grams. <coughs> Any questions? Yeah, no. Yeah, so we found that in our balance equation, we need six uh, CO2s for every one glucose. And that's how we find our ratio. All right, number 20. OK, what are we going to do first for number 20? We're trying to find how many grams of water we need in a combustion reaction. Balance it first. So if you're in Dr. Beasley's class, remember what a combustion reaction is. And same thing for Patino. You have your carbon-containing compounds plus oxygen yield CO2 plus water. Every single time, all the time, that's what a combustion reaction is. So we're going to balance it. We have, let's see, 2 h show. is that it? 2 oxygen. OK. So we have 12 grams of carbon dioxide. We have to change that into moles. So we know that one mole CO2, 44 grams CO2. OK. We're trying to find grams of water. So we need to convert to moles of water. So we know that for every one mole CO2, we get two moles of H2O. Okay. 
After we find our moles of H2O, we get our molar mass of H2O, which is 18.02. So 18.02 grams of H2O over one mole H2O. Calculate this all out, and we should get 9.8 grams of H2O. Any questions on that one? No? Awesome. All right, number 21. OK, we have a reaction between alum aluminum and sulfuric acid. How many moles of hydrogen gas can be attained? with five moles of aluminum and seven moles of sulfuric acid. So what does this sound like? Limiting reactant problem? So what's our first step? Balance it. You should always balance it. So we need two, two, three, Okay, so next we're going to take our moles of aluminum and find out how many moles of, let's say, hydrogen gas we can form. So we have to find the limiting reactant first. That's what we're doing right now. So we were given five moles of aluminum, so we're going to find out how many moles of hydrogen gas we can produce. It doesn't have to be hydrogen gas. It can be anything. You could choose hydrogen gas or aluminum sulfate. So times 3 moles hydrogen over 2 moles aluminum, which equals 7.5 moles hydrogen. OK. Our next one we were given was sulfuric acid. So we have 7 moles. H2SO4. And we know that it has a 3 to 3 ratio. So 3 moles H2 over 3 moles H2SO4. Those will cancel and you'll get 7 moles H2. Okay, given this information, we know that with 5 moles of aluminum, we can make 7.5 moles of hydrogen gas, and with 7 moles of uh, sulfuric acid, we can make seven moles of hydrogen gas. So what is our limiting reactant? So H2SO4 or sulfuric acid. So how many moles of hydrogen can we make from this compound? Seven. We can, always, we can only make seven even though we have excess aluminum. Excess, so you're just going to subtract. So no, no, no. no. So you're going to find out how many moles of aluminum you have. So you can take 7 moles H2SO4. Do the mole-to-mole -mole ratio, which would be 2 over 3. So you can use, yeah. Yep, perfect. So 7 times 2. Yeah. So we get 4.667. So that's how many moles of aluminum we're going to be using. If we subtract the two, we get 0.3 moles of aluminum left. So the five we're given minus the 4.66. Oh, It'll go. Yeah, two moles of aluminum over moles. Yep. Yeah. All right. Are we all good? So he was asking how do we find our excess reactant. So we know that we have aluminum in excess. To find out how much aluminum we have in excess, we have to find out how, many, how much aluminum was consumed. So using our limiting reactant, 
converting it to moles of aluminum, we know that we're going to consume 4.66 moles. Subtract the five moles that we're given, and we get 0.3 moles of excess. Yeah, that's the excess. Yeah. Percent yield. Like, yeah. What do you mean by like? That's like. So if you were, give. Let's say. Okay, you're given these two compounds. You have five moles of aluminum, seven moles of sulfuric acid, and you really get three moles of hydrogen gas. So you're going to take your three moles of hydrogen gas, divide by a seven theoretical. So we're going to take your actual, oh, divide by a theoretical, and so multiply by 100. Yeah. So it'll specifically say you only get this much. It's just actual divided by two. Yes. OK, number 22. How many moles of KBR are in 114 milliliters of 0.85 molar KBR? What is molarity? Moles over liters. Okay. How do we convert our milliliters into liters? Divide by a thousand, so we have 0.114 liters over. We're trying to find our moles, so over x, which, e which equals 0 0.85 molar. Okay. If we multiply these two, we get x, which would be. 0 0.097. So again, we know that molarity is moles per liter. We have uh, our liters, but not moles. And we know that equals 0 0.85, cross multiplication, and we get 0 0.097. Any questions with that? Okay. Number 23, uh, Patino's people. Uh, are, is RBOH soluble or insoluble? Insoluble? Be honest, I don't even know. So yeah, RBOH is insoluble. Uh, BASO4, soluble, insoluble? Insoluble. NaOH, soluble, good. So hydroxide is always soluble. Calcium nitrate, soluble. AgCl, insoluble. For Beasley's people, you will get this. Yeah. So you just need to look and find out. Do you all, you're in Beasley. Do you know how to use it? Okay. So you guys don't know how lucky you are. Okay, moving on. How's it going? All right, so <laughs> oxidation reactions. How are we going to find out our oxidation? Yes. Previous? OK. You have to memorize the table. Is this a practice? Uh, is this, sorry, is this a practice for the final? Or? Yeah, it's on uh, the study union website. Um, which? But if you have questions, you can ask them later. OK, I'm sorry. No, you're good. All right. OK. What are our oxidation rules? Oxidation rules, anyone? So elements in there. So three elements have an oxidation state of 0. So magnesium will be 0. HCl, what do you get a name first? Hydrogen. So hydrogen has a plus one, which would make chlorine minus one. 
Okay. Next, we have magnesium and chloride. What are we going to name first? <coughs> magnesium. So two plus. Okay. Chlorine. Two minus is the total charge. But since we have two chlorines, we know that chlorine is going to have a minus one charge total. So magnesium has a two plus charge overall. And in order for it to cancel out, we know that chlorine has to have a minus two charge overall. But we have two chlorine atoms, so we need to multiply the charge by two. So negative one times two is negative two. The negative two charge will cancel out the po positive two charge. Yes. Unless they're specified, like in the second part. Is there, is there like an exception about O2? Or about O2? Yeah, so O2 could be a peroxide, which would be um, like minus one. Okay. But Other it'll say, like, like it could be minus one, minus two, and it might be minus three. I might be wrong in the second, that part, but, so but you don't have to worry about that until later. Okay. So like yeah, MG go ahead. MG How? We look at our periodic table, and it's uh, alkaline earth metal. So we know that all these have a plus two charge, all these have a plus one charge. Okay. And that's, sure. Okay. It's one of the early rules. I was just asking <laughs> about the O2 as it, as it. Hydrogen peroxide? Yeah, but like, but it's for the scope of this class, it's yeah. like two minus. Two minus, yeah. Have to yeah. Okay. And then, sorry, one more question. Yeah. And then Okay, next we have hydrogen gas. What is our charge on hydrogen gas? Zero because it's in its natural elemental state. So our magnesium is going from a zero to a two plus, And our hydrogen is going from a plus one to a zero. So how do we remember oxidation and reduction? Oil rig. So oxidation is losing. Reduction is gaining. So going from that aspect, what is, what is magnesium doing? It is losing electrons, so it's going from 0 to plus 2. The only way for it to become a positive charge is to lose electrons. So we know it's oxidation. It's going to write a no. OK? What? So yeah. So agents are the opposite. So magnesium is being oxidized, but it is the reducing agent. Magnesium is being oxidized, but it is the reducing agent. Oxidation is losing electrons, and it's going from a 0 to a plus 2. OK? So are any questions on that one? So magnesium is being oxidized, and it is the reducing agent. So Mg oxidize or so magnesium is either oxidized or the reducing agent. OK, our next part, we have aluminum by itself. What's its charge? Zero. Okay, silver, what's its charge? Plus one, because we have this little plus in the corner. So plus one. Yep. Aluminum, plus three. Silver, zero. So what's being oxidized, what's being reduced? So yeah, aluminum is being oxidized. And silver is being reduced. Okay. So silver is reduced because it is going from plus one to zero. So in order for it to get to plus one to zero, it has to gain an electron. Okay. And you don't, you can just ignore coefficients. Yeah. 
OK, part C. This is a long one. What are we going to name first? Potassium. So plus one. What do we name second? Oxygen. What's our oxygen? Minus two. We have four of them, so it's going to be contributing a minus eight charge. Knowing that, how are we going to find our charge on manganese? So we have to get to a neutral compound, so it has to be plus seven. Or yeah, we can add them together. So manganese is plus seven. OK, KNO2. What are we going to name first? Potassium plus one. Uh, so we have to name our oxygen first, and then our nitrogen. If we look at the little box, it's like hydrogen, oxygen, and then so on. So minus two. It's contributing two of them, so it's going to be a minus four charge. So in order for it to cancel, it has to be what? Plus three. Yes. I was going to ask that, yeah. So, uh, so like, if they're four atomic ions, you just imagine they're not there, and you look at each element one by one for each compound? Uh, you're going to look at the overall charge. Okay. So, like, so like for KNO2? Yeah. That's KNO2? So the overall is zero. So I just add up the charges of the individual atoms in there? So you know that nitrate is a, what is it, three, minus one, minus two? Yeah, so I think minus one. Minus one. So you're, you find your oxygen first, okay. and then you know that nitrogen plus oxygen has to have a minus one charge. Okay. So like we'll do that for the sulfur of the magnesium sulfate. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work. Oh, so you really do have to know that. You should. You'll see. So uh, sulfate, hydrogen sulfate. What are we going to name first? Hydrogen plus one. We have two of them, so it's going to be a plus two. Which we name second? Oxygen, which is minus two. We have eight of them, or we have four of them, so it's going to be minus eight. What's our charge on sulfate? Plus six. OK. Next compound, MnSO4. What are we going to name first? Does manganese have a predictable charge? No. So can we name that first? No. So we go to the sulfate next. What do we name first, the sulfur or the oxygen? Oxygen has a what charge? Minus two. We have four of them, so we have a minus four. What's the charge on sulfate? Oh, yeah, minus eight. So, no. Uh, sulfur will be a plus six because the overall charge on sulfate is a minus two. So the sulfate ion, SO4, minus two. So we know the oxygen will be at minus two. Minus 8 is contributing. We have to get to a minus 2 ion, so sulfur has to be plus 6. OK, so manganese. What's the overall charge on manganese? Plus 2, I think. Yeah, plus 2. OK, KNO2, NO3, potassium nitrate. What do you name first? Potassium, plus 1. Next. Oxygen, minus two, we have six. So what does nitrogen have to be? Plus five. Yeah. So, yeah, so manganese sulfate, manganese is a transition element, so we don't know the actual charge on it. Yeah. So we have to go to sulfate. Sulfate has a minus two charge as an ion. We can name oxygen first, and then we name sulfur. Oh, yeah, and then, but for it to be neutral, we have to get the negative two charge. Yeah, charge. so in order for it to be, or for it to be negative. in order for the whole compound to be neutral, manganese has to have a plus two charge. Okay. Yeah. OK, yeah? Sulfur 
So no, you're going to name oxidation in order to get the compound to a negative two. And the only way sulfur can have a plus six, or in order, the only way for sulfate to have a plus six compound, plus minus two compound is if sulfur is a plus six. Don't look at the periodic table for that. You're going to look at the periodic table for your alkaline earth metals, your alkaline metals, and your halogens. So it's because this is in just a metal and you don't know its charge, you have to determine the charge of S yeah. So even though sulfur is right here, it can still form different charges besides the minus two. I don't think you'll get a question like this, but this is just for practice. Okay, so K2SO4, what are we going to name first? Potassium, so we have a plus two. Uh, plus one, we have plus two overall. Which we name second? Oxygen, which is what? Minus two. Minus eight overall, so what does sulfur have to be? Plus six. H2O. You're going to name hydrogen first, plus one. Minus two. Okay? So looking at this, we know that manganese is going from a seven to a plus six. And what was it, nitrogen? Nitrogen goes from a plus three to a minus a plus five. I have a question. Yeah. So yeah, you can look at the periodic table. Hydrogen's going to be a plus one charge. And you have two of them, so it's going to be two plus. That's for, uh, huh? Yeah. So hydrogen will have a plus one charge. Always. There's two of them, so it'll be a two plus. Hydrogen gas will have a neutral zero because it's in its elemental state, free state. Yes, okay. overall. Yeah. It'll be plus one per hydrogen atom. And when you're looking at oxidation reduction reactions, you're going to be looking at the individual atoms, not the overall charge. So you're going to be looking at the plus one of the hydrogen, not the plus two of the overall. You need the overall to find the other charges. So what you have written plus one and minus two is correct? Yes. OK. So manganese is going from plus 7 to plus 6. What is happening? Gaining an electron. So what does that mean? It's reduced. Thank you. OK, so nitrogen is going from a plus 3 to a plus 5. It's oxidized because it is losing electrons. So MN equals reduced going from a plus 7 to a plus 6. And equals. So it's going from a plus 3 to a plus 5. Is potassium also oxidized? So what is potassium going from? Uh, no. Potassium going from a plus one to plus one. I, yeah. The minus two is from the oxygen. It's not over here. Oh, I was looking at, I think, in the, okay, K2SO4. So potassium has an individual, remember, you're going to look at your individuals, not the overall. So ov individually, it has a plus one charge still, so it's not, nothing's happening to it. You have two potassium ions. Yeah. OK. Number 25. We're almost done. Yeah. For H2O, for example. Yeah. You said you started with H. Yep. Why? Because if you have a little chart. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm just, not, I'm just not figuring it out. Like, did you go off of this, like, all the way down to one of the five? Yeah, so hydrogen becomes is first. Okay. So you hydrogen first, then oxygen. OK. Can you explain what a, what a monatomic element would be? Then so, 
a monoatomic element. Let's roll. Like this is quote unquote one hundred two. This is. So yeah. So um, that'd be like sodium, chlorine, any any of these guys. Your alkaline earth metals. These two are gonna have a plus one charge and plus two charge. Hydrogen's the exception. Yeah. Everything on the element besides diatomic and polyatomic? Yeah. So it's F everything. Yeah, everything, okay. everything else. Okay, 25. We have uh, our volume of, so a gas is compressed from initial volume of 3.05 liters to a final volume of 2.31 liters by an external pressure of eight, 1 atm. During the compression of the gas, releases 154 joules of heat. What is the change of internal energy? So first of all, what is the formula for internal energy? Delta E equals Q plus W. So what is that? So work equals negative delta V times the pressure. Okay. Knowing these two things, what are we going to do? What's our change in pressure? Negative 0.74 liters times our pressure, which is 1. Yes, okay. that is part of the equation. So if you were uh, getting bigger, it would have a positive number instead of the negative. Don't we have to convert the Final pressure line. into right. volumes and joules? To so we're not there yet. Oh. But yeah. So doing this, we get negative 0. Point, or positive. Yeah, positive. We have 0 0.74 liters times atmospheres. How do we get that into joules? Convert it. <laughs> so, so 0.74 liters times atmosphere equals 101.3 joules. One liter times ATM. Okay, multiplying that out, we get. Uh, that's our conversion factor. You do have to memorize that. So, 74.96. Okay, 74.96 joules. Okay, during the compression, the gas releases 154 joules of heat. Is that going to be positive or negative? Negative. Negative. So, delta E will equal uh, negative 154 minus or really plus negative 74.96. Yeah. So, well, no. You're going to subtract it. No, you're, yeah. I mean, like, you would subtract 154 from 74.96, but, like, it wouldn't be negative, right? It would just be positive 74.96. No, because you have a. Yeah, that's the word. No. Because isn't W positive? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Going from that, negative 154 plus 74 is negative 79 I got. Oh, okay. Negative 79.0-ish. Any questions? Yeah. It doesn't matter. As long as you have the negative. All 
All right, 26. Yeah. This? So we have to convert our liters times atmospheres into joules. So se uh, 74 times our 101.3 equals the 74.9. Yeah. OK, number 26. How uh, heat capacity of aluminum is 0 0.900 joules per gram degrees Celsius. How much energy is needed to raise the temperature of a 102 gram block of aluminum? What formula are we going to use? Q equals M delta T, uh, M C delta T. C, yeah, specific yeah. I get lazy. <laughs> okay, you're going to use MCAT for everything except for a bomb calorimeter. Bomb calorimeter? Okay. <laughs> this is really dumb, but I know how to remember. Go for it. So this is this is coffee cup calorimetry, right? Yeah. So you need coffee for the M cat, and cats are the bomb. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wait. So, but how do you know it's the bomb? what's the difference between like um, coffee cup and? Coffee? It'll specifically say a bomb calorimeter. It has to say a bomb calorimeter. Otherwise, it's a cup. Yeah. yeah. Okay, going back to this, we're running out of time, I think. Yeah, okay. We have time. But we have to end 15 minutes early. Okay, so uh, how do we, we just plug and chug? So our specific heat is 0.9. So we have a 102 gram block of aluminum. That's our mass. Specific heat capacity is 0.9. Times our delta T, which is. 94 point. Okay. So this will equal 6.59 joules. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. So, I wasn't even paying attention. So, you get 6.59 kilojoules, or joules, 6664.68 joules. Is that what you got? I got 6591. Okay. Okay, so 6659.1.24. Okay, that's how many joules you get. How do we convert that to joules? To kilojoules. To kilojoules, thank you. Move the decimal. Sorry, I'm trying to use my cheat seat. Right. <laughs> Don't pay attention sometimes. <laughs> okay, number 17, Hess's Law. Oh, God. <laughs> All right, how are we going to do this? So, O26 is the top equation that's like your map, I guess? Yep, so we're going to use our top equation as our map. Um, so, we have oxygen gas, huh? Yeah, you should balance it, but I think this is already balanced. One, one, no, it's not. What is it balanced? 
so four, five. Four. It's not balanced. So we'll have four ammonium, five O2, four NO, six H2O. Yeah. Yeah. It's not balanced. No, but like with the two. So good question. That'll yes and no. So how are we going to change that? So we're going to multiply these. So, N so we have O2 at 2 NO. So we need to multiply this by 2, right? We're multiplying it by 2 so that we get 4 NOs and 2 O2s. Okay. So that'll equal negative 361. Okay. What are we going to do to our second equation? Switch it. So we're going to flip it. And anything else? Multiply it by what? When we flip it, what happens to the sign? It changes to a positive. So 91.8 times 2, 183. Yeah. Next one. We're just going to multiply by three. <laughs> so multiply by three, we get negative one four zero point eight. Okay. Going through this. Uh, we add them all together, and we should get. Oh, I didn't do that. You can only multiply or flip it. Yep. You can multiply by a half. Yeah. Why did you flip the second one? So we flipped the second one because we have ammonia on our product side, our reactant side. And in this equation, we have ammonia on our product side. Oh, so okay. in order to get ammonia onto our reactant side, we just have to flip it. Okay. Yep. So we need to multiply it by two because we have two ammonias and we need to get to four ammonias. Okay, number 28. How are we going to do number 28 since it's in a bomb calorimeter? Cat. So Q equals C delta T. Okay. So what are we going to do? Plug it in. Uh, CS is 5.11. Kilojoules per degree C times our change in temperature, which is what? 1.5. Okay. Multiply it, and we get our heat, which is 7 points. You're that's pretty good. 7.665. Kilojoules. So the mass in this thing may be like not necessarily. So what? So we have to find how many. If we're finding delta E, normally delta E is kilojoules per mole. Oh yeah, it's crossing about. Yeah. Okay. So in order for us to find kilojoules per mole, we have to convert our grams into moles. So we're going to convert 0.128 grams times the molar mass. I didn't write that down. So 12 times. So 
So grams one mole over 152.08 grams. Okay, so this is how many moles of the substance we have. Since we're trying to find kilojoules per mole, we're going to divide the 7.665 kilojoules, divide by our moles, 0.0084 moles. That'll equal 9119114.16 kilojoules per mole. Uh, normally, delta E is uh, kilojoules per mole. And, we have, what, and what did we get? Kilojoules. kilojoules per mole is our final unit. In the beginning, we had kilojoules. Like what, like, okay, so I'm just going to take the first step. Negative. So I got 2.6. I mean, the final point is that we have 5. Hang on. Yeah. Because the temperature is, yeah, because. What's your question? Okay, so I'm, I got lost after the first part. Okay. So we got Q equals 7.665. What is that? Like Kilojoules. Kilojoules. Yeah. Wait, what? No, we can keep it in kilojoules, but delta E, which is what we're trying to find, is normally expressed in kilojoules per mole. And how do we find the delta E? Delta E will be kilojoules per mole. Hang on. Before you guys all leave, I have surveys. If you guys could fill them out. If you liked me, good. If not, I'm sorry. <laughs> Apparently, do <too> much. How dare you? Actually, anyway. My entire paycheck revolves. Okay, so yeah, you're good. We just got kilojoules first.